so good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the third TOGAF user group. And uh, looking around the room, there are some unfamiliar faces and some what I might refer to as TOGAF royalty here. Um, we do have, I know, an Ask the Expert session in the uh, second half of this morning, so we certainly have some of those in the room. Um, but uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Steve Nunn. I'm the President and CEO of the Open Group. And it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you for making the effort to come. And um, how many of you do not use TOGAF? OK, so it wasn't a pre-qualification for being here that you actually are a user, but it was a good clue that you might be interested if you are. So. Um, you are one of 57,000, well, 57,987 people are certified to TOGAF as we stand here now. And the rate at which that's growing, it's quite possible that by the time we leave, we will have crossed the 58,000 barrier. It's that kind of number and that kind of take up of TOGAF. There's way more people using it than are certified, of course. Uh, many are trained and not certified. Many just get asked by their management to go figure out what this TOGAF stuff is. Um, give, me, give me a TOGAF. Give me one of those things. So there's a huge community out there. TOGAF is used in a, a very large percentage of the world's top companies, and, and I mean the world's top companies all around the world. Um, wherever we go, there is demand and interest in TOGAF. So you are part of a very large community. TOGAF is a standard here at the Open Group that is evolved um, by one of our groups called the Architecture Forum, the Open Group Architecture Forum. They represent a very small percentage of that huge community. There are, there are a lot of them, but um, uh, as a percentage of the whole, it's a very small group. So one of our motivations for doing these meetings is to try and hear from people who aren't necessarily living and breathing the standard itself in terms of evolving it and maintaining it over the years, but those who, of you who are using it in anger in your day jobs. Hopefully not too much anger, but um, certainly those of you who are using it for real. What, you, what uh, we're interested in, your experiences, what you've learned from using it, and uh, any ways that we might be able, Terry will talk more about this shortly, but any ways um, that you might suggest that TOGAF can be improved, what you think is really great about it, just your impressions, any of that stuff that comes out will be of, of value to us. In terms of what we hope you get out of it, um, hopefully have you, you have your own ideas coming here today, but certainly I think the opportunity to share um, what's worked, what hasn't worked with other people using it in different organizations, um, here having the opportunity to talk to some of the people who have been working with this for uh, a long, long time now and do know the standard inside out. Um, you'll have that opportunity. And really just to also try and have some fun. Um, the, the debate format that we, we have uh, this morning, we did that for the first time last uh, three months ago in London. It was both very entertaining and, uh, and I think very um, well received. So um, it's, a, it's a relatively short agenda, but I know everyone's busy, and we appreciate you taking time out of your, your day jobs to go. I'm not going to take up any more time except um, to repeat a really genuine welcome to the Open Group um, uh, this morning. And I'll, I'll hand over to your MC for the day, uh, Terry Blevins. Well, uh, I want to repeat what uh, Steve mentioned. Thank you very, very much for taking time uh, to come out and share in your experiences, hopefully get uh, enlightened and, and uh, engage in the process of, of making uh, TOGAF more useful for you because this is, this is really about uh, how we can capture some information that will help TOGAF evolve in a direction that makes it a better tool for you and better for the businesses that you, that you support. The proposition is business architecture and business architects should be within the business side of an organization. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Chris Armstrong with APG, and I am uh, representing the proposition that business architecture should be owned and governed by the core functional or operational capability leaders, uh, such as the CEO, COO, uh, functional unit managers, and the like. And um, you know, I guess I'd like to you know, really start the, the proposition maybe more for, from one of fear, uh, uncertainty, and doubt. 
out. Uh, <laughs> namely, if the, if the business does not own business architecture, uh, I will claim it will be unsuccessful and unsustainable. So I'm going to kind of be making a contrary argument to some extent. And you know, starting with uh, you know, maybe just a, you know, a replay of, of history, you know, how many people here have heard uh, of this claim of a misalignment between the business and IT? All right. Um, I believe, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, necessarily uh, just controversial, provocative here, I believe that's actually false. There is no misalignment. Absolutely none. IT built what the business wanted exactly the way the business said they want it built. They didn't care what we had to say about some of the consequences and side effects, because they said, oh, that's just all IT stuff. <laughs> so so I, I, again, I sincerely believe that the business got exactly what they wanted, except they were surprised with how perhaps inefficient and ineffective uh, some of their investments have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, unfolded. Uh, uh, and when we take a look at the, uh, the, the spread of the landscape across the enterprise. So I think you know, a big part of what we're seeing is really just the, the maturation um, of this business and our profession, you know, over the past so many years, you know, back in the day, um, you know, we called this stuff what computer science, right? You know, because it was all about the computers and having to be, you know, very scientific about it. And then we kind of moved into an era of uh, data processing. You guys remember that sort of stuff? And then we moved into, you know, more information technology. And now we're moving towards uh, kind of passe now, but, you know, the, the service-oriented approach, right? But what, what we've, I think what, you know, all those things represent is a narrowing of the proximity between these two artificial boundaries within an organization. Um, and, of course, we're we at now in 2016 we are in the era of digital business right and so I believe in the future there will be no distinction between the business and IT and in fact I think uh, many organizations um, and you know and this may be an interesting topic for a future debate might be um, what is the future of technology architecture I kind of believe as a you know a startup organization uh, my company um, I, you know, it took me a while just because of where I came from, of not really having, you know, comfort of, you know, not knowing where the servers were and who I could call when things broke and who I could go beat up. But I've, you know, gotten over that, you know, paradigm shift where it's like, why do I care what technology Salesforce is on and Box is on and our learning management? You know, I still care about interoperability, information's of a great concern. So what, what I kind of see is that, again, this really represents, you know, kind of flipping things, you know, upside down. I think technology is not going to become completely irrelevant because there's still people who have to make all that stuff work. But what, what's going to supplant it, I, I believe, is business architecture. You know, that is the key essential thing, you know, that we've been missing to really connect the enterprise. And, you know, the, the things that I've heard from uh, both business and IT people, I was at one organization that actually forbade someone in IT calling themselves a business architect. Because how could you be a business architect if you're not a business person? Now, and so they basically said, you could call yourself anything else you want. So IT came up with an interesting name called process architect. That was kind of a little bit off, but it was really a business architect in function, not in name. But I think the, you know, the key thing here, the, 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 the big thing that we've got to help our partners overcome is not so much the word business, but the word architect. Um, and I think in some ways, and we've got some, we got, I think we've got some soul searching to do within the profession here, is whenever, you know, I've noticed that whenever you mention the word architecture, um, people start shaking and trembling and, you know, <laughs> hiding behind plants and changing the subject. And so there seems to be this, this disdain and in, innate fear of architecture. And I think that comes out of a lot of, you know, good and bad reasons of historical experiences. So I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, what we really need to do is help the, uh, the business really be responsible for itself, because that's really what I think business architecture is all about. I mean, ultimately, uh, if we take a big step back, what is business architecture really trying to provide to the enterprise is transparency. What is going on in the business? And I believe, you know, the big issue with this pres presum presumption of misalignment between the business and IT is actually not, again, between business and IT, it's between the business and itself. 
the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. We make you know, unintentional, uh, redundant investments in the same you know, capability without no ne you know, necessarily added value or benefit. And then the business gets surprised when they're finding they're spending ignorant amounts of money on something that they don't think is very important. So I think you know, that, that business architecture needs to be on the business side for a couple of reasons. A, have any of you also noticed that uh, enterprise architecture as a overall profession tends to have an ebb and flow with the economic times? Right, so when the economic uh, uh, downturns a little bit, what's one of the first groups of people that get downsized or uh, completely eradicated? Enterprise architecture, it's a non-essential sort of service. But what, as many of you may know, you know a lot of organizations you know, are you know, trying to respond to you know, changes in their uh, uh, ecosystems and their customer bases. One minute. And we need the ability to be able to respond to that you know, in a real effective sort of way. But if we don't have, again, that transparency across the enterprise about what's going on, I think the businesses can continue to, uh, to make, uh, find themselves uh, their own worst enemy, as, as someone said in, uh, I think the plenary from Pogo, you know, we have met the enemy and, and he is us. I think the other thing about it is you know, ultimately we need business support for continuity, funding, um, ownership, and at the end of the day, I, I just really think it's time for the business people to grow up and you know and join you know uh, the real world and take responsibility for really you know scientifically and rigorously managing managing their enterprise. And so, one of the things that I'd also propose is maybe calling it business architecture isn't very helpful. The way I look at it is it's really enterprise business intelligence. How can I possibly not? If I don't know what's going on in my enterprise, how can I make intelligent investment decisions? And I think that's the reason we need to have the business architects on the business side. Well done. Well timed. Boy, impressive. Are you so, ready there? Thank you. So, good morning. All right. So, I'm going to start really. I always feel so. This is a second of these debates where I have uh, faced off to my worthy opponent, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, I always feel gently intimidated by um, his, his highly skilled and competent presentation to start off with. Um, and I also, this time, uh, seem to be stood on a trap door. <laughs> and I just want to know where the handle is and what happens to the loser. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so Karen, so business architecture, the proposition, um, so I wanted to take the proposition and just turn it a slight little bit on the dial because actually I, I don't believe when we're talking about what we want to do with TOGAF and business architecture that the thing we want to debate is where do the business architects live within an organization? Who do they report to? That, that to me is an organizational construct. Uh, I think really, in the, and you might have seen it in some of the conversations, some of the strap lines, Business architecture, where is it owned and governed from within a business, actually has material consequence for an organization and for the way that you do enterprise architecture. So, so that's where I'm kind of coming in and thinking about. And, and just to kind of unpack that slightly, um, you know, what, what I mean by uh, 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 the ownership part isn't a possession belonging thing, you know, who owns it, who are the only people that can touch it, who are the only people that can sort of say, say that this is our thing. Um, I'm really talking about the responsibility. Who's responsible for worrying about this stuff, right? Making sure that it makes sense, it's coherent, uh, it's comprehensive, it kind of uh, does what we need it to do. Um, and I'm talking about the uh, practice of doing or exercising business architecture in, in this case, clearly we are saying, uh, and what are the consequences for a standard like TOGAF in that case as well. Um, so for me, if you think about business architecture, clearly that's a business-wide asset. Wherever I put that asset and say somebody somewhere is going to be responsible for it, somebody else will have a different view potentially. So there's no one obvious answer, end of. There's always going to be some ambiguity around that. But um, you can say the people who create the architecture, who are the people who produce it, are the people who are going to have to own that going forward. So there is an element of, of development now. 
Today, I see business architecture as part of enterprise architecture. Um, you know, enterprise architecture is incomplete without business architecture. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think anyone would say that enterprise architecture, if you took business architecture out, would be as valuable to the business. So, in that sense, are we really saying, as part of this notion, that we'd want to separate them? Because you would separate them uh, by trying to treat them differently, using different standards to do that. Um, and, you know, would, you, would I no longer be able to say, I am an enterprise architect, if I don't do business architecture, would I have to be a everything else but not business? It gets a little bit kind of tribal for me in a lot of ways. Um, and one of the key things if you think about enterprise architecture is that's focusing on business architecture, but actually um, information architecture, a key part of, of any of the things that we look at wherever we are, is a business asset. And extremely hard, you couldn't leave it behind. So if you took business architecture out, you'd take information architecture out as well. You'd have to. It'd be part of the whole fabric of what you were creating in the enterprise, the processes use information, that sort of thing. So you'd end up with, with well, not a lot left, actually. So it kind of gets a bit, sort of, where does this cleaver come down on this, this concept? Um, and the other part is, you know, the thought of rewinding TOGAF specification back to seven is quite awful, actually. So I'll just leave that at that. <laughs> um, but, um, so, one of my main uh, concerns with, with thinking about business architecture as a separate construct that's created by different people um, is around governance. Now, I've been in enterprise architecture for a long time. I've practiced as, a, as an enterprise architect before I joined IBM, in, so I've got the real world scars, if you like. And, um, governance was the big part. It's all right creating stuff, but if nobody respects it, if nobody uses it, if nobody knows how to use it, then it's just paperware, right? Or wherever you store it nowadays. So governance is absolutely key. I cannot, in my mind, reconcile how you govern with two separate constructs responsible for end-to-end -end governance. Because, you know, how would that work for a project? If I was a project, uh, I mean, you know, as projects get more and more agile, and if you want to know about that one, then go to our previous debate. <laughs> um, but if you want to get projects to become more and more agile, they're wanting a, an easier, lighter touch with governance, if any. Um, and um, they are essentially the customer of architecture, is the way I think about that. Now, how do you get a trade-off? How does a business architectural design authority understand what it can concede to a project, what a project should be doing, if it's not doing it at the same time that you're worrying about what the technical architectural authority that you've created separately is doing. So there is a need to kind of do all that in one place. Um, n to say nothing of, of, of how do you reconcile two feuding uh, 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 gods like a chief business architect and a chief technical architect, that just sounds, you'd, you'd have to have something over the top of that. So, um, the other part is, as well, and this is really because uh, so many other things are moving on, technology uh, and, and the pace of change and agile. From an architectural point of view, um, you know, our existing enterprise architecture capabilities have skills, they have the framework, they have the capability, they have the experience in an enterprise-wide perspective already. Um, Reversing on that would mean that the architectural world would, it be, would take longer to catch up with the rest of the world and what that needs in terms of projects and technology. So um, that would be my main point. And we'll take questions um, as long as uh, time per permits. And we have 45 minutes uh, allocated. So uh, please, someone stand behind this gentleman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this is so cool. That's what you're doing, um, killing time. <laughs> and then after which we'll close the floor and we'll uh, go on to the next uh, part of the debate. Please start Ready? with okay. your questions. Hopefully everyone can hear me. There you go. Well, my name is Gabriel Gonzalez. I work for BMC Software. And um, we have been using TOGAF. And this is where this question comes from. Uh, and my initial stance is with you that business architecture needs to reside in the business. Uh, you bring up a very good point in that there's got to be this overarching entity that looks at business architecture as well as information, as well as 
um, technical architecture. And that's exactly the way we do it at our, com at our company, right? So we go into customer sites, we have enterprise architects, they look at the business architecture, therefore they're looking and talking to the business architect. And then we look at domain architecture, and therefore we're talking and looking at domain architect. Um, so how do you reconcile that? Uh, because to me, the logical thing would be that there's an enterprise architect looking at the entire landscape. And if I look at the ADM, that's exactly what the ADM represents. It's a complete circle that has business architecture, technical, et cetera. So to me, I, I'm still with you because the business architect is the guy that I'm going to, or girl I'm going to be interfacing with. And I need to have this overarching governance body around the entire thing. So to me, I think that both of y'all are <laughs> sharing similar ideas, but I, I feel the business architect needs to be on the business architect on, on the business side. This because that person knows that information more than anybody else. And the EA needs to be able to interpret that and then apply it to whatever strategies or, I'm sorry, whatever initiatives the business has and then trickle that down to the technical guys, right? That's kind of the way we do it. Uh, so any comments on that? And well, and, and I think my, you know, my, uh, again, respected opponent uh, talked about, uh, you know, that, that we need this holistic, you know, end-to-end, -end, you know, sort of view, um, and that there certainly could be some governance challenges of having some separation of concerns. Uh, but, but I think it, it, it's going to test a little bit as, as this profession continues to mature, you know, what is the difference? You know, because I'll admit it's not real clear to me sometimes. To me, enterprise architect, you know, the, the qualifier enterprise really represents span of influence. Right? And so again, TOGAF has a taxonomy that has, you know, strategic and segment capability, perhaps different flavors of the extent of influence that we had in business data application technology. Um, you know, those represent specializations in particular domains. So then we get into some really interesting, you know, word games. Are, are you an enterprise business architect? Uh, are you a segment business architect? Um, I've heard, you know, people use enterprise solution architect. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, that I find particularly curious about the architecture profession in this regard is I know of no other profession that goes to such extent to dis differentiate itself from its peers, right? I mean, do we see business project managers, application project managers, technology project managers, do business analysts have this differentiation? So there's something really kind of weird going on, I think, in the architecture uh, profession. But one of the things that I do think the TOGAF ADM does a disservice to, and this may be, again, re reflective of ancestry and pedigree, is... <laughs> Um, you look at the bubbles, right? Architecture vision, business architecture, IS architecture, and technology architecture. My opinion, based on experience, is that the business architecture has the scope and even more complexity than the entirety of the IT architecture. Yet, when we look at our methods, it appears to be a smaller portion as it relates to the other uh, three phases. So I think that's something that's not particularly uh, uh, well represented. I, I think ultimately, you know, we need to have the business architects uh, being uh, integrated with the business because I just think there's, it's inherently risky and we need to be careful and check our, you know, our arrogance at the door that that we feel that because we have this enterprise architect label, that just because we come up with value streams and capability models, that the business is going to believe and buy into that. Right. So right. it's got to be driven from the business side. We're, we're actually going through that process right now. And if you could comment, if, if you, you want to. I'd love to. You've got free will. It's up to you. <laughs> so, and you can have a seat now. OK. So, Thank you very much. So when I was running uh, the architecture office, right? And deliberately use that term in, in uh, the UK Post Office, Royal Mail. Uh, I wanted everybody to call themselves an enterprise architect, not a business architect or a process architect or a security architect or whatever else. They had strengths, specialisms, sweet spots, and there were people who were way, way more comfortable and way, more, you know, way better at technology or information or whatever else, and they had their kind of preferences. Um, so you still had those people that were really got the business, maybe came from the business, had their relationships with the business, got the bit, and, and were able to talk to people outside and say that this is how we do stuff and whatever else. But, but that team, that group, that office of the architect, the office of the chief architect was enterprise wide. That was that, that perspective. And um, the point for me 
in that role, and, and I've said this before, one of my favorite kind of anecdotes by this is I wasn't, I was the chief architect, but I was not the biggest architect in the building, okay? My job was about enabling the processes of enterprise architecture, including, for example, what standards should we operate? How do we face off to different suppliers, the customers, the whole ecosystem part? How do we do governance? That sort of stuff. Um, you don't want that set up with two different things. You know, imagine you've got a chief business architect and a chief technology architect decide they want two different standards. How do you reconcile that within your own organization, let alone across the ecosystem of all the other partners and suppliers you're dealing with? So, so for me, the, um, you know, Chris is absolutely right. We're ridiculously tribal. You know, I'm an infrastructure architect. I don't do that. I'm the whatever, right? Uh, but in fact, actually, enterprise architecture as a discipline it is it has to be kind of for me managed and structured from one place. Um, so that's that's where I'd see it. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Tony Meiji. I've been in. Uh, IT for 15 plus years as an architect. And my, my question is, I just wanted a little clarification about the debate. For example, are you like uh, focusing mostly on the business side and are you focusing mostly on the technology side? Just a little bit of clarification because sometimes like the difference between enterprise and business is almost the same because a business is an enterprise. So what I'm asking specifically, you, are you are more focused on the technology side and, you, and can both right. of you clarify exactly what the debate is about so that... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, because okay. I know there's all this nuance between technology and business and uh, I, I pretty much understand clearly what you were saying but I was a little bit um, not clear on the difference between the technology side that you were saying. If you want to clarify, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, I'll kick off then if that's... So, um, apologies for the confusion then. Um, so, um, so, absolutely not. Not focusing on just one domain. So, the fact that uh, I, I'm putting it all in one place. So, it's not about technology. It's not about application functionality. It's not about integration, infrastructure, <coughs> whatever. Um, for me, it is about the entire set of domains that make up enterprise architecture, all in the same place, all looked at from the same perspective. And, and I, if, as I've got the floor, I'll give you a small example why, and I'll, I'll, I haven't yet heard the dingy thing, so maybe I will, whatever the dingy thing is called. Um, I, I, me and my team, uh, as an example, of what I, I sort of mentioned uh, the, the UK post office, we would get called into business strategy meetings because we were the only people in the business other than the chief executive themselves who had a true side-to-side uh, -side perspective of what was happening at any one point in time. Even the chief marketing officer was worrying about new product development, new kind of services, you know, advertising, branding, but wasn't aware of the way that we were opening and closing the branch network, for example. I say opening and closing, I, I, the emphasis is on the last word. Um, and the, uh, but, you know, and, but the chief operating officer was worried about the weekly sales targets, the weekly performance, the network of operation, the flow of cash, that sort of thing. So actually, um, I used to get a phone call from the chief exec saying, I need you or, or one of the people to come in because we're about to do whatever it was, right? Some program in the rural. And I need to know what the implications there are of that on all the existing in-flight projects and programs we've got, on what that means, whether we're going to be able to do it or not, what the challenges that will bring. And um, as I say, we were the only ones with that kind of perspective. And, and, and my fear is that if you divide any of it up, you lose that perspective. And that's the value that an enterprise architecture approach brings to an organization. That's why, to me, a corporate body invests in that unit. We may get lost along the way as to why, what we actually do, but that's the principle of what we should actually be doing. Uh, I'm Wayne Gore with the Texas Department of Transportation, and I think this might be his follow-up question somewhat. Uh, we don't do IT. 
we build roads. And so we are not, as not an IT group, we struggle with this same thing. And so my question for Paul is, you brought up that one of your premise was that if you have your people creating it, creating your architecture, they need to own it. In our position, that's a, a, a role we would outsource. And then have somebody come in and tell us how to build an architecture, what's complete, and how we should govern it, and then we would take that over. So how would that fit into your model if we don't have ownership? And then the flip side is, how could we do that where we have business going out and doing an architecture in IT, going out and doing an architecture and it's owned in different places and have something that works together and is complete? Uh, you know, so, so I, I guess, you know, there certainly are some risks with uh, some separation um, of concerns, but I guess I would, you know, ask us to possibly be reflective that separation of concerns is an architectural way of thinking, right? Um, again, don't separate things just because they can, you know, try to have, you know, high cohesion and loose coupling, right? Um, and, you know, and I think as we've mo been moving through this, we've been kind of taking it from a slightly different uh, tact. Um, and I'll, I'll confuse the issue even further um, <laughs> by suggesting not only do I believe business architecture needs to be owned by the business, I believe enterprise architecture needs to be owned by the business. And that we just happen to be in an interesting state in the maturity of our profession where I believe, and, and, and Mr. Holman you know, kind of uh, uh, you know, brought this up, that we are really surrogates for the business. We are doing what the business should be doing, but they don't know that they're supposed to do it. They don't know how to do it. And I'm trying to, you know, apart of some of my cynicism and uh, pessimism at time, business people are not dumb people. I mean, if they were dumb people, they'd be out of business, right? <laughs> but they don't have the tools of the trade that we've been had to figure out from an IT perspective to survive. We've come up with methods and tools and semantics and, and taxonomies and, and engineering because that's what we had to do to survive in the IT business. Well, what, what I claim is that businesses are going to be faced with the exact same thing in the very, uh, very near future, if not you know, already. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a, a fan of all of that being completely uh, business driven. I think uh, uh, Paul was also talking about, you know, the end-to-end the, the -end perspective and holistic perspective that a lot of the architects bring to the table. I think, again, that's really also just a state of industry as well, is because we should not have to be reliant on individual people for that perspective. There are best practices for doing this within our profession, and it's called describe an enterprise language, commonly called a meta model, uh, support it by using tools, populate that repository of content that leads to what we are calling, again, an enterprise business intelligence platform. Namely, I shouldn't have to rely on Paul showing up at work to give me that end-to-end -end view of the enterprise. That's, a, again, a very organic, tribal way of doing stuff. It's what's gotten to us to, uh, to where we are right now. But to really create a digital business, I think we have to digitize that entire platform so that we're not reliant on people showing up and, under, and trying to get uh, their perspectives from a, a, a much more low fidelity uh, uh, manual interpretation. Okay, thanks. Um, so if I can come back to the, to the question in particular, because something that, that intrigued me in particular, and is the term you talked about, you said you outsourced your architecture. And, um, <coughs> You know, I'd want to unpick that statement slightly because I think at the end of the day what you do is you source the provision of your architecture from different places but actually you still remain accountable for the architecture that you end up with. So you don't really outsource the architecture and you don't care. You outsource the responsibility for somebody to provision bits of it or all of it, however that happens, right? And and I think um, that still means you have to have that perspective of, how, of what your enterprise architecture should be that supports your business model. Um, and however you do that, you know, that, I think that's, that was a key thing for me that you said in it. But however you do that, I still think that that perspective um, is, is an enterprise architecture perspective. It's not a differentiated business architecture thing that's separate to to technology, um, you know, they have to go hand in hand. And, and more and more, I think, 
and, and I, I wouldn't say that this is uh, uh, landed, but I think it's an important part of the whole thinking piece. Um, you know, the traditional stacking of architecture and kind of, you know, we all know the sort of the history of, 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 uh, of architecture from a kind of technology point of view. Those lower levels, my, in my experience, I'm finding people are, uh, are, are obtaining as services, they're, obtain they're not worried about the detail of them as much. And actually the concentration is more about, well, what are the services that I need to buy at a business level in order to be able to do that and how it's done and how many servers make up the provision. I don't care because it's not my problem anymore. Um, so, but you still have to have that, well, how does that work across the whole enterprise? So um, th th that's my view on that, in that sense. So. Thank you. Next question, please. My name is Aaron Brown, and I'm with the city of Austin. I'm a senior IT enterprise architect there. And this problem is a, really, is a real one, but um, I wanted to add a little bit of detail. So in your presumption, the business is an entity. At the city of Austin, I have 35 businesses that all are all operated as stovepipes that are entities. So with your tribal approach, I, I understand what you're saying, but right now there's nine inventory systems at the city of Austin because each one of them knew their own business, knew exactly what they needed. Some of them had their own funding impetus and went out, and now we have multiple resources doing the same thing. There is no our organizational planning that occurs because these businesses are being tribal. They're, you, they're, you have the right word there, it is tribal. So when we're asked by business leaders to have a five or 10 year plan to include new architectures, to go to the cloud, to facilitate technologies for them, I understand that the business owner in each of those stovepipes, they dictate what they need. But what they need is not related to the technology. So they're gonna get the business problem, but they shouldn't be telling us how to solve that through technology. So what happens is someone has to, at an architectural level, make, make the call, whether it's consensus with 15 organizations and 15 enterprise architects all fighting it out, because if you've got 35 departments and a budget, only 10 of them are gonna get what they need. So who decides which of those 35 tribe members are eliminated and the 10 that get it. So there has to be a layer above that manages and governs the strategic direction. And if you have a strategic direction, then you kind of have to own it at an upper level. Thank you. So. That was right on that. <laughs> and thank you, I finally met somebody who had more lines of business to manage than me. I only had 34. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> And that's not, I didn't just make that number up. I had 32 when I first took on the post at Royal Mail, but the McKinsey's found another two that we needed. How you make 34 lines of business out of the Royal Mail is still an interesting question, but um, absolutely. I, I was in a corporate role. I was the chief architect across all of those lines of business. Governance was, I have lots of scars of governance because 32 budget holders as well, so you know. Where was the power? Um, but it's an interesting point because um, could there have been a corporate level business architecture team with a business architecture responsibility? Well, at corporate level, they didn't dictate the business strategy for the individual business units. They dictated, this is the profit and loss we want from you. This is the budget return and, and corporate responsibility we want from you. But within that, you're gonna have to kind of work it out. Um, to a degree, I oversimplify. Could there have been a unit? Yeah, it would have made my job a lot harder, a lot harder, because I would have had an, an internal fight as to how do we reconcile, let alone how do I get across all of the different, like, different organizations. So um, I think it's a, it's a really, really important point. So thank you, I just agree. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think uh, to some extent, you know, what you've described, you know, uh, makes one of my points earlier, namely, um, whether it's been intentional or accidental or haphazard, um, if the business views itself as being how many different 
entities, 35 different operating units. That appears to be an expression of corporate culture. So we believe we are not one corporate entity. We are 35 separate corporate entities. And, uh, and the business um, should not be surprised when there are side effects and consequences of that particular perspective. So either they fess up and own up to it and say, yeah, that's the way it is. And you know, it kind of gets a little ugly and you know, complicated. Or we want a different way, you know, a, different, a different platform, a different path to get to some higher levels of performance and, uh, uh, and capability. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I think particularly business architecture can help with is, is, is really help discern uh, that finer point between what people want and what they need. Because my opinion is people tell you what they want and that is not what they need. And just like as many of you know that are raising children, just because someone wants something does not mean they get it. But you know, if that's the if that's the way that the operating model works, then that must is a, is a pretty explicit statement of we are okay with this mode of operation. So you know, I'm sure that you you know find you know significant challenges uh, in that particular perspective. And but you know, again, we want to be thoughtful about again over centralization. Um, you know, we do want to spread responsibilities out across the federated enterprise, but we do need to have some way to kind of pull it all together. In my opinion, to really achieve that transparency, because again, I think the real challenges the, you know the left hand of the business doesn't really understand what the right hand is doing and then when once all the dust settles and they find out what their investments were and they go how come we spent you know three times as much money here doing something uh, and, and did it in triplicate when we completely ignored something that we felt was more uh, more important so to me that leads more to again the business really needs to start taking responsibility for the consequences of how they've set up their operating model and, and how that unfolds and I believe business architecture is the solution to that problem. Um, I've heard some very, very interesting arguments on both sides. And, and um, there, there's some fundamental problems being discussed here. It's like, uh, you know, if the business is not in the business best interest to do business architecture, why should IT take up the bill? And, and IT needs the business to do it, to fill out the artifacts anyway, to build up the, the models and the capability models. So why is IT carrying up the job if it's really business information. But I want to flip the discussion a little bit just and move away from discussing the fundamental problems we see today and just discussing how would the world, when we detach business architecture from TOGAF and send it to the business, how would a world like that work? Are we going to then, uh, is IT going to say, here's what I need from you now since you're running business architecture? Uh, I would like to hear your take on that. Uh, sure. I, again, I think a part of this, again, is, is really state of industry, um, namely how many people that are, you know, the CEOs and on boards of major companies learned when they went to business school that enterprise architecture and business architecture was a key capability for delivering strategy. Uh, big fat zero, right? So t in some ways, I believe that this is going to be a battle of attrition to some extent. Again, my p pessimism and cynicism is that we just have to wait for some of these people to die um, and retire. Um, or um, perhaps a little less morbid, um, their, their companies to go out of business because they didn't understand how to do this uh, more effectively. So I'm, I'm hopeful of future leaders bringing this understanding that with how can, because most, as you guys know, most companies don't have a problem with formulating strategy. They have a problem executing and delivering on strategy. And that's what business architecture can really provide that framework uh, for doing. In uh, Edinburgh last year at the TOGAF conference, uh, I was fortunate enough to bring along my main client, who is BAE Systems Submarines. And they make nuclear submarines in the UK. And uh, they'd undertaken a business architecture project that was only business architecture domain, but took the enterprise architecture approach and used positive omission, catchword in the TOGAF specification, to say, well, we're not going to look at the technology and uh, you know, application function uh, parts of it. And when I say business architecture, it was business architecture and information architecture, because you couldn't pick the two apart. So it kind of did that, and it, and it went through. Now, in fact, actually, as they went through the project, and I'll explain the dynamic of it in a second. So I went through the project, there were parts which were technology-enabled. 
right? So people start going, oh, well, actually, you know, let's talk about blah, 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 wearables. You know, things that people were comfortable with, you're kind of going, actually, now we are down into some form of technology. But it didn't matter that it was kind of merging a little bit. You had to interpret that. That was the kind of uh, uh, piece behind it. But, but those people that did that, that used TOGAF to develop <coughs> the architectural vision and the architecture roadmap uh, were uh, from the operations function. I don't like saying they were business people because that makes it sound like the IT people weren't. They're employed by the same business, so they are all part of the same thing, right? Um, but they were from the operations team. They were engineers. Um, and when uh, I asked them and said, can you come along and present you know, to the TOGAF conference, they went, but we're not architects. And I kind of, well, you've just architected all of this, right? <laughs> so I don't know what you need to say to feel confident in front of this group that you are architects for of what you've done. Um, but yeah, so that was an example. And then if I can just add to that, um, there are a number of organizations that I've worked with, and I, I work predominantly in the aerospace and defense industries, but, um, but also automotive and stuff like that particularly engineering organizations, where I found that engineering communities are using TOGAF to define operating models. And yes, I, I think there is an issue about presentation. Here is coming out of an IT function. This is what you have to do. Absolutely. But that's an organizational dynamic communication uh, you know, stakeholder management thing, I think, that needs to, that I would say, rather than preventing it. So. I'm, short, I'm short, too. Uh, <laughs> Wayne Hughes with Dell. Um, I'm just going to do a reflection because this kind of reminds me of, I, I really didn't live it. I wasn't that, uh, I'm not that old. But back in the 70s, when you had your mainframe computers and you had your programmers, and you had your hardware and your software, and nor the twain should meet. Well, all of a sudden, somebody said, wait a second, we need to know what they're doing because we need the machines to be able to do their programs. And the programming people went, well, we don't really care what you do over there. Just do it. So all of a sudden, it became an IT group and they melded and they became one. And I, I, it's just kind of a reflection of, you know, what you're talking about now has been going on for 30, 40 years. And it will go on for 30 or 40 more years, I'm sure. But the, yes, there, there is a, a, a point to where you need to say, we need to make a business decision rather than Let's just let these guys go play. Thank you. Well, I, I, the merging and the melding, I think, is, is, abs is, is key because, as you say, it's a, it's, a, it's a divide that's useful to start off with, but then actually when it comes together, you, know, it, you need it to kind of work together. And I think um, I, th that was part of the reason why, in the proposition, I was quite keen to see that, you know, that there was this role of what is the CIO and what is the, or, or whatever that supporting capability may be around that delivery piece. And I think that there is a key role around uh, transformation and adoption of the latest kinds of technologies um, that uh, uh, affect businesses and the transformation piece going forward. So um, uh, I, I see that merging of capability uh, uh, quite, quite key, I, I, I'd agree, actually. So. Uh, and, I, and I think I would, you know, generally agree, you know, uh, uh, perhaps you guys have, you know, gotten one of my perspectives, which is, you know, this is just a natural evolution of where we're going as a profession, um, as, as the, you know, world's economies and businesses continue uh, uh, to evolve. And, and also, you know, echo what uh, Paul said earlier, that there are people that are doing business architecture in the business, but they don't know that it's considered business architecture. You know, so for example, have anybody you know here ever been through a, a, a reorg? 
<laughs> and usually that's like, okay, let me check what time it is, right? Um, and, and in my opinion is that the people that are doing that, are they're changing the business architecture. The problem is, is they don't have the skill set. The enterprise view when they do that, they use primitive tools like, you know, cuneiform, you know, clay tablets and smoke signals. <laughs> but their intent is very similar to what we're doing. So again, you know, it's, it's just very interesting that convergence that's kind of happening. So, you know, the separation that is often perceived, I think, out there is perhaps much narrower than, uh, than it really is in the real world. My name is uh, Srini Penchkala. I work for uh, GM. Uh, great discussion. So I think my question is mainly for Paul, but I would also love to hear Chris's uh, uh, comments on that. So if IT were to own business architecture, uh, how would we get the business to sponsor the strategic initiatives? You know, that's, uh, that's the whole EA goal, right? You know, how do we deliver solutions that work for not only today's requirements, but also how they are the building stepping stones for the long-term solutions, right? So how can we get the business to buy into you know, sponsoring the strategic initiatives rather than fixing you know, like just the tactical, uh, being in a tactical mode all, all, the, all the time? Thank you. That's a great point. And the only thing I'd, I'd pick up in the, in the question, if you like, is um, there's a need to change the, change the bit that we say about IT owning the business architecture. Because that, I think, is the shift. Is it's not about IT owning the business architecture. It's about having one cohesive unit. And I think that comes at, and I call that enterprise architecture, that has business architecture as one of those domains now. In a lot of senses, that can come out of the current IT construct. But it's about up gaming what the, the building the game up of what the CIO function is, if you like. Uh, just to kind of uh, to illustrate what exactly, and I think it comes back to the, and I'm still in awe of the 35 business units because 34 <laughs> nearly killed me, right? Nearly killed me, and I thought it was a world record, but you know. <laughs> um, but um, you know, if I take an example there, uh, 35 lines of business. I, I don't know your business, but I'll, I'll make a sweeping assumption that um, you don't have 35 distinct sets of customers that those face off to, right? So if I look at in terms of the Royal Mail, as an example, I would post mail, receive mail, and buy TV license. And that was, a, you know, that's not three different lines of business as far as I'm concerned. With I'm one customer to them, as far as I'm concerned. So that's, I need, they, you know, single view of customer was an information problem. Now is that a business architecture problem? Or is it a technical architecture problem? No, it's neither. It's both. It has to be solved in, in one. Actually, it's not one or the other. And, and, but there is a credibility issue about the appropriate team of people, the function of people being able to be responsible for that, for all of it. Uh, well, I, again, I, I, I think uh, you, you addressed it very uh, effectively, Paul. You know, the, 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 uh, although I do, I, I have seen organizations that are taking this path where the IT architecture is really pushing upstream, you know, trying to push a noodle up a hill, right? Of trying to get the inner, you know, the business people, please, will you pay attention? Will you take responsibility? You're killing us. You're just killing us. Um, but, but there is a risk that, again, if that is perceived as an IT thing, that content and practice just is not going to be embraced and not going to be, you know, accepted. So we do need to be thoughtful about how do we, how do we manage that transition, you know, from, from the dark ages to the renaissance as, as as it were, and, and, and really help the business people understand and identify those key players within the business community that have that uh, span of influence, those, uh, so some of those technical skills. And I think that's one of the things that frightens people about you know, becoming business architects, is, oh, it's very technical. And a lot of people confuse technical with technology, because they're right. It is technical. There are techniques for modeling and for doing trade-off analysis and assessment. But you know, they learned how to do amortization and, and derivatives. I mean, that's incredibly technical stuff. So it's not beyond their innate competency as business people. Thank you. My name is Segura Levin from General Motors. Uh, I have this question. Um, you know, I, I was one of those people you know, who are in the middle, you know, not sure whether it should be business one or the IT one. Because the reason I'm saying is that the, the, the line between IT and business is disappearing slowly, right? So uh, what role IT is itself is playing the role of the business? You know, because in many cases, 
IT is the business, you know. Uh, IT technology is driving uh, the business. And, uh, and how do technology transformations play the roles in enterprise architecture? And one last question is that, how do this you know, collaborative governance going to take place? Because information governance across all these layers is very important uh, because even though we say business owns the business, business knows the business, because there is many segments of business. They have to work with each other. You know, there's, there is a place where IT plays that role. There's a place where business plays a role. Now, how that, so with that, with that, all that mix, is that really something, you know, you know, one organization owns it, or is it more of a collaborative organization between both IT and business? Um, well, I, ultimately, I think it's a collaborative thing. You know, as, as Paul suggests, you know, who is actually the owner of things? I think is subjected to reporting lines and and you know, uh, funding vehicles and stuff like that. Um, uh, but I do, I, I you know, uh, even though I do believe enterprise architecture should be a completely business business driven uh, sort of thing, there's no doubt that there are going to be individuals within the IT organization that takes responsibility for a portion of that you know stack. Um, I do believe again the differentiation between business and IT is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, and, and again, if you think about business, you know, you know, represents the entirety of the enterprise. To me, that just kind of comes with that IT, you know, is naturally uh, a kind of a part of that. So uh, if I try and pick up on, on, on what I heard you were asking, I think one of the points is for me um, that kind of uh, reflection of business architecture within uh, we're doing. And, and, and just to kind of give an example for me, um, and this comes back to some of the other things that are being asked about that credibility piece and the, and the, and the join up. Um, if I stood up and yes, I've got an IT background and I said I was going to take over the business architecture for a business and dictate what was happening and, and tell people what they could and couldn't do, I know I wouldn't last very long at all. Um, however, at the same time, if I was not able to hold a mirror up to the business and capture what in real time and reflect it in some form of architectural uh, uh, um, capture, I'm going to repeat the word, but if I couldn't capture it in some way in order to be able to align it with everything else that needed to be done across that whole set of stacks, then, then I'd be operating blind. So, so, I, so I need it. And therefore, I think I've got a role that says, because I need it, I can facilitate it for the rest of the business. So that's really what I'm asking permission for, is just to be the custodian and the facilitator, not the person who says, you can't sell that product. Uh, you can't work in this way on this site or whatever. So I think that's one side. And then the other part, really, um, you talked about technology driving uh, the, the, the changes. And I think... That, for me, is uh, uh, absolutely key. But, but what I'm going to kind of throw in, I've had a conversation fairly recently with, a, with an engineering community uh, who make planes. And uh, they're not IT people at all, but clearly very clever people. And they were talking about what they needed to do from a capability point of view. And that's a taboo word at the minute. But anyway, capability and what they needed to do and how they were going to deliver that. Um, they could not do that without dropping through the stack and talking about information and talking about functionality and about some of the deltas, some of the changes they needed from a technology point of view. You know, it is almost impossible for them to describe what they need somebody who's servicing a plane in the field needs to do without referring to mobility, as an example, which suddenly drops into the technology piece. So actually, even if you said they were just doing business architecture, they need to look through, and they do drop through parts of the stack. So you end up with this commonality, which is why I say it has to be controlled in, in one place. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Last question. Uh, in my opinion, the, this debate is a lot about organizational readiness and what the, you know, what the organization wants to do. What challenges are they trying to accomplish? Where does IT fit within the strategy and the direction of the company? Okay. So that discussion, the debate kind of leans one way or the other, and I, I'm wanting to hear your opinion. Do you believe black, you know, black, and this is a black and white, that business architecture should be in business or in IT? Or do you, do you, what are your thoughts that 
it should be, it is organizational driven. Uh, number two is, what are the consequences? Why does it matter? So important thing is you're thinking about architecture. You're thinking about how does my investment align to what I'm building? At a very basic level, that's what it's about. Why does it matter? When I, say, when I ask that, well, I'm not being you know, critical, but it's, it's more like a question of what does it mean if, you, if, if the business architect is in the business or the business architect is in IT, what does it mean? What are the financial consequences or strategic consequences of that? Thank you. Uh, well, well I, I think uh, uh, ultimately, you know, again, there may be some, again, uh, historical organizational emergence issues about why, you know, does architecture emerge from IT or the business. You know, but but I, 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 I ultimately believe in order for uh, this to be sustainable and executable and really add value, you, we've got to have that rapport with the business, right? Um, and I think if we set, a, set it up from coming out of IT, we're, we're automatically just making it even more complicated uh, than it could be, you know, in setting up that kind of adversarial battle of trying to convince the business that what we're talking about from an architecture perspective is worthy. I, I really think that what we really want to do is, you know, elevate the value proposition to much more uh, higher perspective. In, in my opinion, um, what the, 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 the litmus test of the goodness of any architecture, no matter what domain it's at, what, whatever level of abstraction, is how well does it allow you to respond to change? To me, that is the sole reason we have architecture, with the idea being we want to design or architect our enterprises to anticipate change and not have to figure out how we retrofit it after changes happen and we're trying to keep all the parts together. So to me, it's really a fundamental business operational philosophy. Are we going to or, you know, set ourselves up for success in a continually changing business and technology environment. If that's the way of business moving forward, then let's start taking steps to address those by really adopting an architecture-based way of, of, of looking at our business, making invest investment decisions, and operating our business. Organizationally, is it, does it depend on the context? Uh, to a degree, yes, because it does depend on how federated you are, you know, kind of the, the state of the business, as you say, how mature they are, and, and really um, the practices and, and the things. So, so yes, there is, an, there is an element of, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all, uh, granted. Um, however, um, I, I, I've seen practices with a separate business architecture capability and um, an IT architecture capability. And inevitably, um, you end up crossing over because if you're gonna implement a system in the technology world, you need to know what processes to put in. Somebody's gonna start creating swim lanes. It might come from a third party vendor. They need to know information, models, et cetera, and all that, and that will be delivered by. So you, you, they, they're in that space, whether we like it or not, they've got to do that. And similarly, in the business, uh, architecture said, as I said before, you know, they, they might talk about capabilities and, and, and what, what we're going to do. As soon as you get into processes, you're talking about what information is used, who does it, what roles are they performing, um, you know, and what are they doing it with? What tooling do they need in the widest sense, whether that's a, a, you know, a system or a socket wrench or a book, or whatever. Um, so there is, there is an inevitably overlap. Um, now, if you can, if for me, Enterprise architecture is an approach. If you can get the two people who are accountable for making sure that all joins up absolutely harmonious and agreeing to use the same standard, the same meta model, the same taxonomy, you know, the same way of working at the same rate of change and have the same dialogue with everybody else across the business, great. Chances are I can't see that happening. Right? So when I come back to, as I say, I think there needs to be something that coordinates and puts all that together. You can have specialisms, you can have preferences, but there has to be one practice that says, for this enterprise, we will have one standard, one way of capturing our information and reconciling it. I don't mind if the business architects take the lead within that team um, for being responsible for making sure it reflects a business model or, or whoever, however you want to do the construct underneath, but it's about how you make that join up. Otherwise, what happens is um, you'll end up with, uh, as I've seen somewhere else, 
uh, you know, a chief exec going, I've got two single A4 pages of my business on a page. I love the ideas that chief execs think the whole business can be boiled down to one page. And, oh, the open floor's closed. Um, and Trap the door. fact that they can actually, they can actually, you know, uh, compete and say, well, which one is the one that, that I should, uh, uh, should use? And I think that should just come from one place rather than from two. Come up. Okay, so here we go. We're now uh, uh, on the summation portion of this venture. Uh, Paul, you now have five minutes. My main point here, just to kind of add something slightly different uh, in terms of rather than just repeating some of the stuff that I've said, is um, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, 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 in my work, I, I get to uh, interact with a lot of uh, CIOs from different companies. And uh, this is a gross generalization, but broadly tends to be the kind of way that I'm seeing, seeing this happen at the minute, is um, the CIOs have got two uh, agendas. And these agendas are getting uh, two different agendas, two different styles mostly these days. And they are being driven more and more to extreme ends of this sort of uh, uh, approach. Um, by the disruptive technologies we're seeing, what's happening in business models, you know, the, the, the constant change that I don't need to tell everybody about. But that, and, and what, I'm, what I'm seeing is there are those CIOs who are recognizing that um, their team's role, their function's role, their responsibility for helping drive business transformation is absolutely paramount, right? And that uh, they are the people, nothing can be done in the model, everything is driven through them, they have a major role in delivering that transformation. And then there are other CIOs who are, whose remit is very much about uh, a lowest cost provider, if you like, right? So being a service provider. And, and, it's, and it is getting to the point where you can almost say it's one or the other, right? It's a, it's an, it's a ridiculous oversimplification, but it kind of tends to work most places they go to. In the former, so this part of this role, what we're really seeing there is that the office of the CIO has to up its game to, to really help drive that business transformation. It has to have business architecture inside as part of that capability, in, in, in my under, uh, belief, to be able to deliver the promise of that business transformation because nothing moves without technology it, and, and you look at what technology is doing now to business models not just to you know the kind of uh, efficiency base um, so anybody who wants to operate in that latter model and most CIOs that I know want to be in that space they may be forced to be in the uh, rationalization space but any that are in that space are looking for that to build their own uh, credentials and their own credibility and uh, they need to back that credibility up with a full suite of enterprise architecture capabilities all housed under one place. So that's my, my summary. All right, Chris, you now have. All right, uh, probably I uh, won't need all the time as well. Uh, I think we've had a, a great debate, exchange of ideas. Uh, but I, uh, I'm still on the side that, uh, so unfortunately, Mr. Holman, I've, you haven't swayed me. Uh, that the business architecture should be owned and governed by the business for issues of credibility, issues of rapport, issues of continuity, uh, issues of funding. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, the IT organization is a reflection of the business. So when the business goes, hey, how come you know, we're so fractured and we have this redundancy and it's because, well, that's because of the way the business is. And so we really need to provide that overarching, you know, umbrella. The business needs to take responsibility for it. Um, we may need to provide some, again, surrogacy or babysitting along the way until they, you know, build those skill sets. But I guess the thing I'd like to throw out there is that in many ways, IT is really often, uh, you know, charged with efficiency. You know, so how can I make things, you know, more quicker, more affordable, more scalable? But there's a there's a finite capacity for how that's really going to deliver business results. And that's really, I think, the flip side that business architecture delivers, which is how can I actually transform my business to be more effective? 
And that's different than being efficient. And I think without business architecture setting that stage, the organizations are going uh, uh, to continue uh, uh, to struggle. So that's all I got to say about that. Well, uh, the result is um, a slight, uh, uh, a little bit more on the uh, uh, against, one, one additional uh, person on the against position, um, three less on the for position. And that, I'm assuming that means a few more on uh, the abstains.